Hello everyone and welcome to Nocturnal Horrors. My name is Sean Masral and today we have a very special guest because we are discussing one of the, maybe not all-time greats, but it's definitely a classic in the horror world. We're talking about The Legend of Hell House from director John Howe and written by Richard Matheson from the book Hell House, also by Richard Matheson. So today I have... Mike from Rotted Reviews here. Um, for anyone who doesn't know his channel, definitely check it out right away. Subscribe. He has done everything from 176 reviews in a row on the daily, which I'm not even going to try to comprehend how he got that done, but has also done amazing things with the always present Amityville Horror franchise which is now, I believe, 31 films in total. He's also done the same thing for Jew on the Grudge. These are very, very in-depth videos, so please check those out. And also, he has one of the best Patreons out there for your buck. He does everything from daily vlogs that are called uh, Rotted Ramblings. Rotted Ramblings is weekly. Weekly, all right? <laughs> daily would be a little much. <laughs> oh, did I say daily? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put you to work. Uh, so he's done behind the scenes videos as well as he's got watch parties, a Discord. So definitely check him out on Patreon. He is Mike from Roddy Reviews. Thank you so much for being here, Mike. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Legend of Hell House. Enough of this. Legend of Hell Legend House. Legend of Hell House. You saw it at a very early age, and it made an impact. Tell me about your, your thoughts towards the movie before watching it now. I was introduced to, uh, first and foremost, the 1963 The Haunting. And it was kind of, uh, you know, I think that my parents and my, my grandmother kind of saw that spark of horror interest in me. So it was kind of like, let's get you some foundational aspects going here. And uh, that was one of her favorites. So introduced me to that. And once I saw it and I loved it, um, it kind of became the next logical step forward to go to the 1973 The Legend of Hell House. Because there's a lot of similarities. It's a very, it, it is an entirely different story, entirely different author. But there is similarities of a, an experimental uh, crew going in for, you know, research purposes or whatever into this haunted house. Uh, kind of it being kind of a ripoff, right? Right. I mean, a lot of people see it that way, um, but I, I don't know. I personally don't. I think that there's enough deviances uh, from it, uh, especially at the, just the core of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I loved the haunting, but I would be lying if I said it scared me that much. The scene in which uh, the professor's wife, you know popped her head out of the up, up above the spiral staircase that did get me but overall i just enjoyed the movie this one scared me the 1973 the legend of hell house scared the pants off of me and there were some creepy aspects to it that i thoroughly enjoyed and probably would be seen as cheesy now but they really got me when i was at that more impressionable i don't know 12 13 years old at that time and it's stuck with me ever since. And it's one of those things where I see people talk about the Shirley Jackson, you know, Haunting of Hill House. And I always have to kind of remind them, it's like, by the way, did you know that this existed? If you like this, check this out. For me, I came at Hell House through the book first, through Richard Matheson. I was um, in high school, I'll probably like, maybe like 16 or 17. And... I had a high school teacher, English teacher, who said, oh, you should try like a Ray Bradbury. I think you might enjoy Ray Bradbury. And, I, you know, I read some of him and then, you know, I loved him. And then I was at the bookstore and I just remember seeing um, I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. And, you know, you know, Steve, Stephen King always has, it seems like he has quotes for basically every single like horror book in some way where he's like, this is the scariest book, or this is the best book. Um, but before, way back then, it wasn't as prevalent. And he said he said something about, you, you know, the most he learned about writing was from Richard Matheson. I was like, I should probably check that guy out, you know. And I went from I Am Legend, and then I went straight to Hell House, and uh, you know, burned through all the books, loved them all, and 
then I watched the movie. Um, and to be fair, when I was, you know, 16, 17, I didn't have a huge love for Legend of Hell House at that point. I loved the book, mm -hmm. but the movie, like, you know, it didn't hit for me. So, and then, you know, cut to, you know, decades later, rereading the book and rereading and, and seeing the movie again, you know, you obviously have a whole different light on everything. You're a completely different person. And, uh, it's pretty fascinating, but you come from the, the movie background, seeing the movie first, right. and then I come from the book first, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what we think and how we, uh, we differ, I guess. Yeah, I think um, I had held off reading the book for a long time, mostly because I didn't want the movie sullied, and as much as I love the movie and I have reverence for it, the, the whole thing about the book is always better, I didn't necessarily want the movie to be uh <laughs> to be overshadowed by something else so i put off put it off for a long while uh, but uh you know for this for the sake of this collaboration i did uh, finally break down and read it i appreciate that uh yeah it's uh it's interesting because it's i mean it's always interesting when you have an adaptation that's done from the author as well because you can have you can have authors who've never written scripts before and it shows, you know, um, and then you can have someone like Richard Matheson who's basically, you know, written so many TV scripts, movie scripts and books all in one. So the guy knows where he's coming from. You know what I mean? He knows what he's doing. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And honestly, like I thought it was a great adaptation. I did really like the book and I did really enjoy the movie. Um, I don't think for me personally, I don't think either of them are like high tier of everything um but they're such they're both such a good time you know what i mean like um oh, yeah. they're both really good times <laughs> we have a dying man in a wheelchair deutsch who uh he's basically brought in two mediums and god what would you what would you call that that douchebag who's just the most arrogant individual in the world that is dr barrett uh i i yeah, I would the let's just say lead investigator, the the person that's approaching it on a strictly scientific. Way. Yeah, so you have the two mediums, and then one of them is the physical medium, the other is the spiritual medium going into it, and then you have Dr. Lionel Barrett, who is the man of research and scientific uh, style, and he's he's yeah. convinced he's he's got it all, he's got all the answers, which is just a marvelous marvelous thing to have all that confidence. <laughs> But to make a point, uh, unlike a lot of traditional men of science uh, characters in these kind of movies, he believes in the, uh, the the mediums. He believes that they are feeling something, that they are uh, uh, causing, uh, you know, these, how did he put it? Like hyper normal, like not supernatural, but super normal. God, it's psychic phenomena, right? Yeah, yeah. He believes in this. Um, he has incredulous uh, thoughts towards the idea of it being life after death, but more just manipulation of energy. Correct. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so the three of them go into the Blasco house, which is known as Hell House. And the Blasco house is a house that was a gigantic mansion created by Emmerich Blasco, who is, he's a millionaire and a little bit of everything from, you know, supposed sadistic murderer cannibal uh lover of the dark arts uh he does it all he's he's a true gem uh so they go to the house and they investigate and their whole goal is you know within a week find out if there's life after death so that uh deutsch knows uh what he's got coming to him <laughs> fair assessment i'd say yeah fair assessment uh you basically get sent there specifically because it's considered the Mount Everest of haunted houses. And if there's going to be an answer, it's going to be right there. That's right. I mean, it's got to be on Mount Everest, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So what did you think of the book? I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm glad that I read it. I'm glad that I finally did break down and read it. Um, you know, I as much love as I have for the movie, um, I also don't, try to candy coat or sugar coat or uh, approach things with starry eyes and I find the blemishes you know prevalent and one of the 
issues that I had, uh, I know we're going to get into the movie, so I'm just going to really kind of sure. really uh, superficially cover it, is there's a lot of decisions that are made by the characters in the movie that are kind of just glossed over and treated with a, it just is. You know, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough film in the camera. We just need to get to the next point. Right. And the book does a very sufficient job of covering the whys of those decisions. And I finally had that kind of level of context for the characters. So providing that, um, providing the whys filled in a lot of those blemishes, gaps. And ultimately, I do have to admit, I enjoyed the book more than the movie. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So is the... Um... <clears throat> Again, we'll get to this later, but does your love for the the movie in general have like big time nostalgic factors for you? Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be the air of nostalgia, and it's one of the difficult things as a film critic is to kind of reapproach those movies in an objective stance yeah. and separate the pros, the cons, sure, and everything in between from the nostalgia, and you know, really just attack it on a on a baseline level, and. Um, so, yeah, nostalgia is always going to be something that's in play. But um, as far as the book goes, um, like I said, it just provided that level of detail that really shined for me. And I think especially in terms of Belasco himself. I mean, it's a character that really didn't exist within the narrative of either the uh, movie or the book. It's not somebody that you saw, you know, flashbacks of him walking around or anything like that. It's more stories being told about him. But for me, the book really brought him to life more. The stories that were being told about him were extremely fascinating. Yeah. To One thing that the book touched on was the, uh, you know, boiling a frog kind of effect that, you know, it, the house wasn't just born to cannibalism and necrophilia and murder and any of this stuff it was a slow progression of uh dependencies that were built up and uh think you know the the notion of the history of the house as this slow progression to ultimately become what it became was really fascinating yeah there's and like that's something that the book covered a lot better than the movie yeah and there's like oh, man. it's crazy too so like for me personally um in terms of reading, like I do think I, I read a fair amount and you definitely have like, I'm like a 350 page to 450 page. Like that's kind of my sweet spot of reading. Um, and this mm -hmm. comes in right about 300. And I, I wish there was like just a touch more of Belasco because he's so fascinating an individual. Be, you know, there's, man, I want to say there's like four, it's like three or four pages where they basically go through nine, 1920 when he like purchases the house and then it's like 1927 where he starts to like really play with things and have his guests over and and you know 1928 mm -hmm. the the furnace goes out and no one fixes it the, he builds the the Roman theater where like a, a starving leopard was it like eats a virgin yeah. you know like and then it all just I mean that's that's one hell of a backstory, you know what I mean? And and as much as incredible I incredible backstory. As much as I don't want more because like it's so fun to fill in the gaps yourself, like I really want to know more about Belasco. He's so so dark and disturbing and wonderful, obviously. I I'll, I'll be honest, there was an element of me after reading the book that wanted like a prequel movie to be made yes. surrounding Belasco. Yeah. It it would be uh it would be kind of like uh, the Firefly family from you know Rob Zombie's movies meets Caligula. Yeah. <laughs> I'd watch that. You know what I mean? That's I, a, I would watch that absolutely. It's true though. Like you, you need really to get somebody on the horn. Like that's really. I mean, that's the story you really want. So like for me, I was hoping for a little bit more of that just because he's so dark. Yeah, he's such a fascinating guy, and um. And in terms of the book as well, I Fisher is a fascinating guy to me because he had all these um, powers as a medium, as a physical medium, at age 15. And then we see him again at 45. I, I want to know what's happening in, in those 30 years, you know? like 
yeah. I mean, that would be another interesting part. So those like like 50 additional more pages of like a little bit more backstory because Fisher's fascinating. I want to see how he gets back to the house. Um, I want to see how he goes through those decades. Um, would have been nice for me personally. But having mm-hmm. said that, and I think one of the reasons why I, I love the book way more as a kid or as a teenager is like, Man, it doesn't. It once it's it once it starts, which is literally like on page one, it doesn't stop. You know what I mean? Like it just keeps going. And I do. I specifically remember um, reading it back in the day, and there was like a list of all the um, phenomena that happened on the Blasco House. And I remember it was like it's like a page and a half of just like this list, right? And you're like. I don't even know half of these words. Like, I need to look these up and figure out. I didn't. I just figured it was like hauntings and poltergeists, you know? Now you're having ectoplasm and, you know, somnambulism and just like a slew of things. And you're just like, I got a lot of research to do if I want to be a ghost investigator, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so, yeah, like the book is just, it starts right away. And, you know, luckily the movie does the same thing. You have the one interview and it's mm-hmm. like, all right. We're there, you know, we start up and I really do appreciate that about the book that it doesn't waste time and it, he does a lot of subtle things, um, more subtle in the movie, but he does a lot of subtle things to have you know more about the characters without sort of just staying on it, you know? Yeah. Matheson's great at, you know, he does that with all of his books, um, and yet still has the science to it, you know, um, he breaks down those EMRs, the electromagnetic uh, uh, reverser, or <laughs> the machine, uh, you know, and he's doing that in I Am Legend, too, when he's breaking down, like, why vampires don't like garlic, why they don't like sunlight. You know, he breaks everything down, um, and in layman's terms, which is fantastic for me. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the book is a great read. Um so what do you think is about some of the changes um, from book to film? What do you think? <clears throat> well, I thought uh, in its entirety, as especially as compared to a lot of books to movies, I thought this one was extremely faithful. Um, you know, I, I, as I was reading the scenes, I was also envisioning, uh, you know, Roddy McDowell sitting in that chair, you know, doing what he did. So... Um, but the changes that they made, it seemed like a lot of them were, like I said, providing that level of why. And I can see why just in terms of filming and, you know, uh, you know, not having a three hour long runtime, they kind of needed to trim some of that out. Um, but then there were some changes that they made that I couldn't really figure out why they made those um, specifically with the uh lead researcher uh character with uh his legs um you know considering uh like uh, they had the this character uh in the movie he's basically just an uptight professor that's just uh the the physical embodiment of smug um and that comes through in the book but he also is uh he had uh, polio when he was you know younger yeah and he you know, recovered from that, but only just like his legs are causing him problems. He needs to take, uh, you know, swims and steams and so forth to get, you know, things moving. Um, and it causes him a tremendous amount of difficulty in terms of like getting up the steps, uh, especially towards the end. Um, and uh, don't want to spoil anything, but the notion of... Spoil uh, it up. We're good for spoilers. Amb- ambulatory movement is a, a big factor yeah. and the idea that they left that out of this character i thought was kind of um i don't i don't know why they uh why they omitted that i thought it was an interesting aspect of the character i'm glad that i read that and i saw that because i thought it was really really well fleshed out i mean realistically e- even in the 70s it's it's I mean, he felt like he was 90 years old at times in the book you know what i mean it was like yeah. and yeah. it really um Come movie time, you you know, when you got things thrown at him and going all over, it's it's nicer that he for me it was nicer that he was younger. Um, but at the same time, you know, like like the polio, the the um, the impotence, the uh, mommy issues. You know, they don't harp on those things, but 
it stays with you and connects a lot of answers for you in the book. Um, and especially with um, his wife, Edith, and her sort of repressed sexual feelings and, you know, mm-hmm. the lack of, you know, what she's getting, what she might need. Um, I feel it's just like it's it's all more connected and makes more sense in the book and, and in the book and, and in the movie they keep it a lot more subtle, you know what I mean? For especially for the wife, right. um, you know, the books that she's reading, this, um, as opposed to like hearing her backstory a little bit more of it. But yeah, I, I like that. I, I kind of like that he was younger and you know more ambulatory because at times you're just like, oh, bro, like come on, get up, like <laughs> you got shit to do. You know what I mean? Like. How long before you get this reverser thing going? Like, how long does it take, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a small change that they made. Was, uh, you know, the, the breaking of that versus just the trouble getting it going in the first place. Yeah. I, I did like the... Um, I did like the character arcs and the uh, the way that Matheson, like, weaves them and does it in both the, the book and the film. But, like, realistically... You start with Barrett, right? Where your first person is to uh, start with Barrett and connect with Barrett and his wife, and that's another thing, right? Like he's got, he's got like in the book. He's got the polio. He's got the like the mm-hmm. the impotence. He's got the old age. Like he's beat up. And then in the movie, they take a lot of that stuff out, but they're definitely alluding to it. I mean, there's that one shot right after he talks to Deutsch and he's talking with Deutsch's guy. And Deutsch's guy is like eight feet tall compared to him, you know? And it's just, it, yeah. it makes it, it, he's like, oh, when you read the book, you're like, oh, that's that's them showing that he's a little man and he's got, you know, he's, he's missing some things that he would like to have. Um, uh, they're just able to do, do things more subtly for, for the movie. But, you know, in the character arcs, you start, you start with Deutsch and then you go to Florence and Florence kind of, takes the reins, right, where, where they, they do their little, their, their, their sit-downs and all these things start to happen and you start finding about Daniel Belasco with her. Um, and the whole time you're, you're going through that and then you're like, okay, when is Ben's time going to come? Where, when is Ben going to wake mm-hmm. up and let his guard down and start it up? Because you know like that's unfinished business with the Belasco house. You know Fisher's got a lot of things to say. You're waiting for that moment. And then with Barrett, who you've left to go to Florence, you're like, like, how can you not have this <laughs> reverser at the at the house right away? Let's go. Like, get it going, you know? Um, but it's great because and then with um Florence as well, it's the chapel, right? So all three of them, mm-hmm. you have this this point where you're waiting for where that's when shit's really going to hit the f- fan. Florence in the chapel, Barrett with the reverser, and Fisher when he finally just lets loose and he's ready to go do it, get things done. You know what I mean? Um, and I love that yeah. about the book and the movie, you know? Yeah, that was an interesting uh, choice as far as the narrative goes is how well, you know, this is not so much, uh, you know, following a protagonist as they go through their journey. This is like a relay race. Uh, where the baton is constantly being handed yes. off. And, you know, yeah, you're right. At the start, we have Barrett, and he's, you know, he's in charge of this. And we get the sense of the other characters. and But we're basically following in his shoes. And at some point, uh, it, it does uh, shift over to, uh, wow, names are escaping me at this point, but the mental medium. Florence. Or the, Florence yeah, the mental medium. Um, and, uh, you know, her escapades is she's, she hypothesizes through her encounters with Belasco and the the house that um, the, the haunting entity, uh, or at least the one that she's experiencing, is the son of Belasco, Daniel Belasco. And then you know we kind of follow her in her journey of trying to figure that out, and you know the whole the whole idea of like story structure of having a character and then conflict and trying to overcome that conflict. Uh, you know, while we're following her around, the conflict is Barrett. He's not believing her. Um, it's actually everybody. Yeah. You know, Barrett's not believing her. Fisher's not backing her up because he's not opening up. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, it, it's interesting watching him kind of walk the tightrope 
between trying to guide her, protect her, and also be com- as non-involved as possible. Um, yeah. Because you're you know, like you said, you know, Fisher was there when he was 14, 15 and barely made it out alive and he's back now. And I think their I think their bond is a lot stronger in the book as well. You know, throughout the book, he's very he he does he wants to open himself up for her but not not for the house. You know what I mean? Like he's been through right. what she's going through and but still like he's like I'm not ready to open up regardless. Uh, as opposed to the movie, I felt like the ending where he's like I got to go back in. I got to do it for Florence. I got to do it for for your your husband. I got to do it for me, knowing that like I am someone and I can do something. You know, it was definitely not because of Florence, like it was more so in the book. Right. So uh, you can tell that he carries that guilt for not opening himself up more and not protecting her more, and mm-hmm. that's the 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 driving force behind him going back in, figuring this out, as well as uh, you know the notion of this is something that he has had haunting him, mm-hmm. you know his memories, his thoughts, his emotions, uh, you know, long after his first round, um, you know, he figured when he first took the job, uh, this this next round, he would go in, close himself off, leave, call it a day. Yeah. And he realized, especially after Florence, yeah, he realized, especially after Florence, that that could no longer be the case, that Mm -hmm. he needed to face this. Yep. Yeah, I mean, how how good is Roddy McDowell, though? (laughs) I love Roddy McDowell so much. Uh, I was really nervous at first, though. Were just absolutely iconic. Yeah. And one of the reasons that I was glad to have picked up the book finally was the scene in which, um, not not the end, uh, you know, where he finally you know opens himself up and you know starts really being more aggressive and going on the offensive. Yeah. Um, but the moment in which he opened things up just a little bit. He let like the guard down. He saw down. what was going on, and he finally decided, I'm not going to close myself off. I'm just going to open the door just a crack and see what happens. In the movie, <laughs> that was perplexing. Uh, I That's mean, the one where really that, with the angles, uh, right? Where he like, looks up and you have those weird sort of angles and feeling. and yeah, Crazy angles. Awesome. Yeah. I mean... It, Perfect, Roddy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, I, I wanted the narrative context behind what was actually going on there, and the book explained that so much better than the movie. Yeah. Did. In the movie, it just kind of looked like he sat down, meditated, and just went bonkers. <laughs> yeah, right away. <laughs> and like you were saying before, it's time constraints are an issue when it comes mm-hmm. to movies. I mean, for me, one of the biggest sort of issues of the movie versus the book is when the Daniel, well, quote unquote, Daniel Belasco um, with um, Florence scene in, in, Mm -hmm. it seems so quick. It's like, okay, like I'm going to take my clothes off. I'm going to get in bed and I love you, you know? And then it happens and you're like, wait, what? Like we're talking about not, not just a, a spiritual medium, but a minister uh, mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you're, well, for you, Daniel, I'll do this, and you're like, what? <laughs> like, it just didn't, it didn't hit, it didn't work. Uh, I, I don't know if it 100 percent worked in the book either, but it worked a lot better than than in the a movie. lot better. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the thing. That was ex- exactly one of the things that I was thinking about when I said that the book fleshed things out and came up with the whys a lot better than the yep. movie did. That was prime example is that did feel kind of out of left field, a little abrupt, um, and uh, frankly, a bit of a head scratcher in terms of the decision to go forward in that in that moment. Uh, whereas in the book, it had a lot more groundwork laid. Yeah. It you know it was very clear the proposition that was on the table much earlier. And how much she, you know, fought against that. Yeah, exactly. And until finally, like, everything had just kind of broken her down. And she was just determined to um, see Daniel, you know, move on and whatever it took at that point. It felt more uh, like uh, still a bit of an extreme, you know, conclusion to come to. But at the very least, we kind of understand the groundwork that was laid. Yeah, exactly. Just want to bring up some of the differences 
So some of the smaller ones, obviously, we have like it's in Maine, New England versus England mm-hmm. in the in the movie, um, which is a fine change. You know, I think I think it worked fine. Um, yeah. I don't. I'm not sure why they changed Edith's name to Anne. I think there's a lot of changes with Edith and Anne, um, same person, but um, let's just say Edith mm-hmm. to make my my head not swivel. Edith, it is. You know, you hear a lot more about in her in the in the book about her issues with her father, her alcoholic father. You know, is she mm-hmm. an alcoholic if she touches the stuff? Um, her uh, repressed sexuality. Um, but even more so, uh, her inability to be alone. Uh, you know, it was just that. Yeah. It was that. You know, she, he, he said something where Dr. Barrett was away for like I don't know, it was like a couple days or a week, and she was having suicidal thoughts, couldn't deal with it, um, which is one of the reasons why she always goes with him to his, um, you know, with his work, parapsychology work, and. Um, mm-hmm. And they even they do say it in the in the very beginning of the movie when they're in the car driving back from the house, you know, you know that she doesn't want to be left alone. But that's hardly the sort of suicidal thinking that she's having um, to the point where I felt like in the book there's no money, there's no hundred thousand because um, because Deutsch dies. Unlike in the movie right. where that never happens, um, there's no money. What a kick in the knackers that was, too. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no money. There's no husband. She has no job. Like, it ends with her saying, like, I'll probably publish the, I'll probably publish the findings of my husband's work. Mm-hmm. And then after that, like, I'm feeling like she's not surviving. Like, she's, she's probably going to commit suicide. Um, versus the movie where it just seemed like, She'll rebound, you know. She'll rebound, like, <laughs> for lack of a better word. It just seemed like eh, way darker in the book for me. And uh, obviously, the book is way more violent, way more gory, um, way more sexual, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to the PG-rated uh, Legend of Hell House. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that was interesting because Edith also works in the book as a. Um, As the person you can relate to a bit because you know nothing. You, like most people watching have no idea what the EMR will do or, you know, what is the ectoplasm coming out of these fingers. And like, you know, for the mediums, it's so normal and regular. Like, of, of course there's ectoplasm coming out of her fingers. Why wouldn't there be? Where Edith is like, uh, y'all see this? Like, this is an issue, you know? Um, it's good to have that you can relate to. And before she oh, yeah. goes, she goes south. <laughs> yeah, I it, mean, it, it helps to have a character that you can kind of unload some exposition onto, uh, just in terms of yeah, explaining it to the audience. Uh, I I like I like the character in the book and the movie probably about the same, uh, but obviously the book was more detailed. And that notion of I think it was, I think it was three weeks that she was apart from him. Okay. Um, but even, I mean, even so, I mean, three weeks, three months, I mean, at some point, you know, stand on your own two feet and love yourself, girl. But, uh, I mean, like when they were describing her fear of being alone and to what degree that actually reached, like that was setting off some major codependent red yeah. alarms and, you know, just, I was just like, holy, wow, this is a lot, you know, that she can't be alone for this amount of time without going to the, these dark places, like this is an interesting character and this is an interesting aspect of that. And considering that all of these people are going into a place that is going to systematically and with a surgeon's precision attack their psyche and their you know emotions and you know figuring out not just, you know, how to you know like how to manipulate them but you know to what severity to what timeline you know we know that we need to apply uh, a soft touch with this person and then ramp it up versus this person we can just go after straight away Uh, that's a hell of a fragile mindset to walk through that doorway yeah i mean even even with florence right and uh him playing some uh, saying some of the lines from uh 
her her movies, right, or her TV show, yeah, yeah. Uh, versus him tapping into her lost brother. Um, mm-hmm. The brother wasn't in the movie, right? No, nothing about the brother was, as far as I remember, nothing about the brother was in the movie. And for Edith, you've got to really wonder, like, what was your long-term goal, because uh, game plan, because he is decades older than you, so he's realistically going to go first, and then what are you going to do if you can't, like, have three weeks by yourself, now you're going to go the rest of your life by yourself? Like, I worry for that girl from the book. She's not going to make it. Yeah, that's that was kind of where I was coming from is that level of worry, uh, which is from a narrative of a you know horror book about haunted houses is a really good starting point. Get you you know good and worried about these characters before they even start encountering things. Yep. The movie takes out the sauna stuff and the pool stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know they have that back and forth in the sauna where she finally goes all in towards him as opposed to Bar- uh, as opposed to. With Fisher, um, yeah, they just took all that out, right? Right. Which I did think was a good, good for both their their character arcs. Um, I don't think it hurt. I don't think it hurt the movie in any way taking it out. But in terms of because in the movie, I think Edith's arc goes away the most because she's the least important, um, which is fair. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, but I did, I did kind of miss the, uh, what is it? He's, he's, after he's died and he, you know, he's dead in the pool as opposed to being killed by the, shan- you know, partly by the chandelier in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. I missed the part where he's just chasing her saying like, it's me, it's me. Like, like I almost pictured like... <laughs> Uh, in Creep Show, like the guy comes back and he's like, "Where's my cake? Where's my cake?" Like, I kind of wanted to see that, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was a really good creepy scene in the book. There's, you know, that chase, especially the one part really got me where, like, she's running uh, alongside him, and you know, when she kind of glances over, he's not looking ahead; like, he's looking straight at her from this, you know, running forward, but looking this way with the, like the obnoxious uh, morphed grin, uh, you know, oh, that, and that no was, cane. That was a good scene. And no cane. Yeah. Yeah. And no cane, no, no limp, no nothing. Uh, just, you know, bolting and not looking forward. And uh, it was, that was really good visually. I mean, at least in my mind's eye, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I could see why they, uh, why they cut the pool and the sauna scene be, uh, for a book. I mean, books and movies obviously, obviously, you know, can operate on very, very, very different levels. Um, and, you know, one of the things about a movie as far as like a tight production and editing is no scene should be included that doesn't drive the narrative forward directly. Um, and I can see how those really didn't, especially with the changes that they made with the character. By eliminating the polio thing with Barrett it did eliminate a lot of the you know subtext of the impotence. Yep. And with the sauna scene, I mean, if you're not going to have the impotence, why have the sauna scene? Because that kind of speaks yep. to that frustration and that repression. Um, so, you know, when you kind of, when you make a change here, it affects things over here. And then you have to ask, you know, does this actually drive the narrative forward? It's like, no, it's good for character development. It's good for, you know, uh, a good creepy moment in a book. But for a movie, it doesn't need to necessarily be there for the storyline. Um, and then, you know, taking that and then weighing it against production costs of actually coming up with a sauna and a pool and so on. Exactly. Uh, it, it makes sense that that was, that was left out. What was some stuff you like really liked about the film? Um, other than the obvious Roddy McDowell performance. I mean, they were all pretty good. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, what stands out to you? The, I like that there was uh, the slow, steady progression that, it, it builds the, the the horror up. It has it starts with a level of tension and suspense. And okay, well, I I mentioned that I saw it as the next evolution from the 1963 The Haunting. Sure. And there's the notion of you know it's not just what you see, it's what you don't see. It's the implied stuff. It's letting your imagination run away with you. And that was still very much in play here, although this did bring more of a direct supernatural. 
um, you know, visual on-screen element to things. So, I mean, it was more extreme. It tackled things like sex. It tackled things like, you know, extreme amounts of violence and so on. Um, but it still wasn't afraid to pull back and let your imagination run wild. So I, I mentioned that some things may seem a little cheesy now, but it worked for me and it still holds up. So the notion of the record player, uh, when they are first getting acclimated to the house, stepping in, there's a record player set up. Uh, and when they play it, or it plays itself, and Belasco's voice comes through. And it's a recording that he did, uh, you know, for guests of his house, because uh, he was kind of a hands-off host. Uh, it was kind of a free-for-all, come in, uh, you know, live as a commune that just happens to, you know, kill and eat people. Uh <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's basically, you know, welcome to my house. I hope you find the answers you're looking for. So it kind of works on a double-edged sword of both the guests of his house at the time and the investigators and in the, you know, uh, later on that, you know, in, uh, visit the place. But then you had the moment directly after that where Barrett is talking, not Barrett, sorry, Fisher's talking about how uh, Belasco has the ability to trick people by getting them to focus on something and operating in the background from there. He's like, are you, you know, that's, uh, Barrett says that, you know, that seems a little far-fetched. He's like, does it? We were all just focused on this record player just now. How do we know that he wasn't walking amongst us right this moment? And for me, like I said, that seems cheesy to some people, but that got me, uh, you know, especially with like the, you know, cobweb that kind of flowed after that in the movie. Um, so those little moments that do let your imagination run wild uh, are used to great effect. And those are the ones that got me the most, I think. You're right. I think it does a really good job of blending the two styles together, right? Where you do have this mm -hmm. graphic stuff happening. Um, but then at the same time, Daniel Belasco and Emmerich Belasco, like you don't see them, right? Throughout the entire movie right. till the end, obviously, um, or when the see the bodies. But... You don't, you don't see, you hear it, you know, you, mm -hmm. he's always present and you never see him. Whereas in the book, you know, the ending, you know, you got this big roaring giant figure coming at him and rah, you know, um, and this, they, they play it, they play it down. And I, I think to great effect, um, you know, but then you also have a cat coming at you, which, which actually I didn't. I didn't find the cat part that bad. I actually kind of found it pretty, uh, pretty crazy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I thought they did really good with the cat. I guess they say like compared to most movies where you're like that is so ridiculously fake. But this one I was kind of like that cat's gonna mess some people up. <laughs> yeah, they got that cat was agitated. Yeah, and then uh, well, even like and then like the the first the first sit down where uh, you know according to Barrett. According to Barrett, Tanner's trying to get rid of him. And, you know, the, mm -hmm. the fire comes out of the fireplace. The, you know, the steak. I've never seen those, by the way. The plate with, like, the gigantic spikes. Yeah. I mean. Like the meat carving station kind yeah, of. Yeah, it was, like, insane. Yeah. Like, coming at him. Like, I mean, the glass. The way the, the glass breaks first. He looks at it and he's, like, has this oh shit moment where I think all sorts of things are going to happen. And then it's just, like like it's fantastic like that stuff's so good to me um when she's by the fire and you have those like beautiful close-ups of her like silhouetted silhouetted with the fire like talking it through like there's just so many great moments um in the movie for me um plus just the i mean just the place in general the the art design um you know, it's like red velvet wall with a mirror for, for Florence's room. And then Barrett's room is like this this deep purple. Um, and then the first time they walk into the house, it's, you know, there's no lighting. And you just have that nice opening of all the light coming in from outside. And it's just, there's a reason why we enjoy those like little horror tropes. You know what I mean? It, it, oh, yeah. It, it just really touches you and like really makes you... Love it. And I mean, there are definitely things where you're like, oh, it might have worked, might not have worked. You know, for me, like, I feel like your Legend of Hell House for me is Amityville Horror. Like, I saw that at a very young age and like, I watch it now and I'm like, 
yeah, there's some issues, but I love it, so you can all go to hell. Um, you know what I mean? Where you're just like, that's terrible, and yet just just hearing some of the voices like still scares me shitless. You know what I mean? Like I hear mm-hmm. the get out scene, and I get shivers. You know. Um, and I imagine like that's a lot of like Belasco's voice for you in a way. You know, for this movie. Yeah. You know, haunted house movies are there's there's a primal aspect of them because we think of houses as safety. You know, we that's where we come in from the storm. That's where we find, uh, you know, comfort and warmth and so on. Um, and the notion of having that not just be something that is unsafe, but to be an active, intelligent, malignant, uh, you know, entity um, that literally surrounds us on all sides is something that that's one of the reasons I love haunted houses uh, or movies so much. And uh, for both Amityville and The Legend of Hell House and, you know, The Haunting and, you know, the, 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 the greats. Um, the progression of horror is one of the best aspects of that for me because there's nothing scarier than the unknown. And if a movie has characters enter the house and just immediately stuff starts going, you know, wrong and blowing up and it, it it's basically revealing its hand way too early. Um, but like with every haunted house storyline, there's the unknown factors. How dangerous is this? How screwed are these people? Um, do they have a chance to escape ever? Uh, I mean, some, you know, like, you know, take the Juan franchise. As soon as they step through the door, this thing's following them and they are just effed. Um, but, you know, as the audience kind of figures out how dangerous this is, how much of a timeline do they have? How bad is this? Is this something where something's just kind of, you know, uh, you know, going to spook them or is it something that's going to eviscerate them? Right. Uh, those questions are unknown. And if we get those answered straight away, it kind of just, you know, that's, that's every, that it gives up the game. But as the characters learn that steadily and slowly over, you know, not necessarily an hour and a half, but let's just say the first hour before things really start to reaching its climactic conclusions, that's where the real thrills happen is as they figure that out, we too are figuring that out. And in those, we have those moments where we don't see something, we only hear something, or we don't see a figure, we see a shadow. Um, and, you know, it allows the imagination to go as we're learning more. And it's just one of the best things ever for me. There, it's almost, it's also like the ghosts are feeling it out too. It's not just like the person feeling out you know, what they're seeing, oh, okay, now I have to investigate. It's like a ghost is just, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put a shadow across the doorway and see how they <laughs> react. Let's see how they react, yeah. you know? Um, what's their threshold? What can I do? Uh, and, you know, I feel like that's the same for, for Belasco too. It's like, he knows Fisher already, right? He's, he's, mm-hmm. he's had that. He knows what he can do, what he can't do. Um, and he, you know, he knows, he knows what Barrett can bring um in the with the EMR and uh you know with Edith I'm sorry not Edith with um Florence it's really like okay this is the one I can work on and work with right away and really get going and have some yeah. fun with and then through her break the others down which I the intelligence of Belasco was something that really drew me um like I said it was methodical and it was surgical and he did a great job of manipulating the group but um yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, the build up and so forth, that is something that, you know, that's an interesting point with the spirits. I mean, you know, it could be a situation of them like waking up and, you know, shaking off the cobwebs, literally. Um, it could be a situation where through the fear of the inhabitants, they grow stronger. Um, so, I mean, there is that kind of, um, you know, rising from slumber aspect of things. And that's uh, and that also speaks to the notion of the house being in some ways, either through a controlled entity or through just being born bad, um, a living entity, uh, which which I dig. I think in terms of things that maybe I wish happened or I wish were a little different in both book and movie, I was actually kind of disappointed that it was just um, Alaska, uh, Blasco. Like, you know, it's basically him the one he's the one entity um, pretending to be all these other entities, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. Where when they first go in, they're like, oh, who's this? Who's this? This is Daniel. This is Daniel. This might be one of the lost, you know, whatever from the bastard bog. Um, I wanted it to be Belasco controlling everything. Like, I was hoping that there were actually, like, the 27 souls of the people who died and who were found dead in there in 1929 or whatever. You know, I wanted them to be stuck there. And I wanted mm-hmm. Belasco to be torturing them while no one else was coming into the house. You know what I mean? As opposed to, like, him just pretending to be all of them. I just thought it would have been a little bit more sinister, a little bit more fun. Um, as opposed to him being more of a, like, the Wizard of Oz, almost in a way. You know what I mean? Where it's like, he's you know, you just open the curtain, you open the lead door. It's like, oh, there he is. Him with his his water or wine just... Thirsty as hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just wanted... I, I wanted all the souls to be in there, I guess. I, I, I Yeah. I, that's my thought. I, I like the... I like the... Uh, I did, well, okay. I didn't mind the whole Belasco acting alone thing. I do think the book did a much better job with its final resolution as far as the uh, revealing the truth of Belasco and so on than the movie did. Yeah, let's talk um, about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean... Yeah, obviously spoilers. We've been doing spoilers this whole time, but <laughs> um, you know, in the movie, uh, you know, the, the whole thing kind of came down to the legs. Um, everything got brought down to the legs in terms of the people that got attacked previously and um, cutting off the legs and so on and so forth and finding him there. Where in the book, I think it was, I mean, there was definitely that aspect of the character, but it didn't seem to be like the central force behind everything. Yeah. Um, because I think honestly that just was a little bit weak. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe not weak, but in terms of the contrast between how much they built Belasco up, to come down to that was just a little bit unsatisfying. And you know, like I said, you know, just being objective about the movie, I can say that. Um, whereas in the book, you know, the thing of the water next to him, I thought was extraordinary. Um, the notion that he had the presence of mind and the will to force himself to die of thirst with a jug of water in the room spoke to th- his the, character, the, 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 the desire and the ability to be this controlling entity in the life beyond, uh, which I thought was just like just taking this. That's what it was. It was taking this character and instead of bringing him down to just the level of, I, Oh, I'm short. Uh, exactly. And elevating him to being that Machiavellian and that um, self-sacrificing to, you know, be that malevolent. Malevolent. Yeah. How, the, that word. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, no, you're, I mean, you're spot on there. It's, it, it changes everything. You're right. You, you, he's not just uh, a, a short dude. It, it really kind of, it just takes away from all that he is and accomplished, right? <laughs> he's mm-hmm. just short, so he's very angry. He's short. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, bro, we all we all got our issues, all right? Get over it. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I mean, he's such a fascinating character, straight up. So fascinating. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned that I would love a prequel with him, but honestly, another thought that I had was I would love to have... Uh, I know this is kind of, you know, like getting into... Uh, uh, fandom territory or, you know, uh, go there, you know, go there, anything on like that. But I would love to see, uh, somebody tackle like a 13 episode Netflix series or something that dealt with the first expedition that Fisher was on when he was 14, 15 years old and reveal more of Belasco and his backstory through that investigation and yeah. see what actually happened to them. I think that that would have been a that, that could be a really interesting narrative. I mean, put that in the hands of Mike Flanagan, and I think he got a winner. Yeah, for sure. I, I that excursion seems just as bad, if not worse, than what they went to, than what we got to see. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And Belasco wins there, so which which is great because we need more Belasco in our lives. <laughs> that was an interesting element, and it's a very small one. But talking about the differences between the book and the movie. Um, very, very small element, but it kind of amounts to a whole lot, is the uh, Fisher switching the machine back on. 
you know, they figured things out. They found the lead lined room, left the door open. And in the book, they just kind of leave the house. You know, the notion of figuring out the mystery seemed to be what conquered Velasco. Whereas I think the movie actually made a little bit more sense. It's like, no, he protected himself in the room. So we're going to open the door and give this another world. There's always something about using using your when a protagonist uses their words to to defeat the antagonist you know what i mean you're kind of just like mm-hmm. oh, okay that's cool like i get it psychologically but it's a little boy it's a little boring you know it doesn't it doesn't quite have that meat you know where it's like i mean even even like a, like a pennywise you know what i mean where they're just uh, you know well, I, don't, yeah. I don't really feel you anymore you, you don't really scare me and it's like well We'll see you in a couple decades. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like done. Um, yeah, so it, it was good to have that little extra bit. And uh, I, I legitimately, when I was watching this time, and I saw Belasco moves, like he just, like the actor just barely moves. I'm like, wait, mm-hmm. he's not dead and mummified? Like he's still alive? Like I had that moment where I'm like, where is this going now? And then I was like, oh, it was just, he just had a, a quick moment. But I was like, He's not about to move, right? Like, if you're preserved that well, like, who knows? You might as well be able to move. I don't know. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was an interesting aspect was, I mean, I think that there's a difference between uh, mummified, uh, hermetically preserved, and Alfred from the Batman movies taking a nap. Exactly. And I think the movie very much looked like he was just taking a nap, didn't get enough sun for a little bit. He was, it was Michael Gao that was just, perfectly preserved yeah it was it was bizarre it did throw me off a little bit it and it's a little um as much as like i mean the whole movie is a bit of a fun house you know but that was total carnival fun house when he when he opened that door you're like oh okay it was yeah i really i mean when I, re- I remember that when i first saw the movie is i was thinking like that this guy was alive the whole time and it, it took me that few minutes i think when he stabbed his you know, fake leg and tore his pants off and the guy still didn't move. I'm like, Oh, okay. I guess, I guess he is dead. Sure. Doesn't look it. Oh my God. Especially seeing it as a, as a kid. (laughs) If if you see someone that preserved, they're alive, bro. Like there's no way around (laughs) that. That dude's alive. (laughs) And he's got the, he's got the cup in his hand. So he's just chilling, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I was kind of, you know, I was like, Hey, you've solved my mystery. Have my gold. (laughs) Yeah. Like Ready Player One or something. I mean, overall, I think this is a film that sort of... It kind of goes under the radar a lot, right? Like, it's not... I don't yeah. feel like it's talked about in terms of your classic haunted house films. I don't think it's talked about as a, a classic horror film in general. Um, and I'm, sh- I'm sure a lot of people who... Um, see it now, probably kind of scoff at it... Um, I don't know if it necessarily holds up, but I mean, when you read the book and then watch it, like it holds up a lot better. Um, it still really works for me though. Like I like it. I enjoyed it. And am, am I getting scared from it? Like, uh, no, not, not at all, but it's hard not to appreciate the technical aspects. It's hard not to appreciate the performances. It's hard not to appreciate the, the writing and the, the characters and, and Belasco, the, and, all of them really like it's a good film it really is Mm -hmm. yeah i I think that there's kind of uh an interesting thing going on in the horror community right now where it's not necessarily like a strict division but you do have a bit of uh people that are like steadfastly against classics and i i i'm nowhere on that side but for the folks that do want to dip their toes into classics this is an interesting one because when you go back enough there's an almost antiseptic quality to a lot of movies including the 1963 the haunting um that kind of breaks apart when we get into the 70s we start tackling more adult material we start having more on-screen kills more gore more blood more sex more violence um And I do think that this is like a good example of something that I would consider to be a solid classic that is a little bit more grown up than its older brethren. 
And for for that reason, amongst many others, it's one that I it's it's one of my first go tos in terms of anybody coming to me asking for a recommendation of, as far as a classic goes. You know what I want to dip my toes into. Uh, you know, films of the 1970s or something like that. It's one of the first ones out of, uh, out of my mouth um, because I do consider it to be a really solid entry. And like I said, I don't know how well it holds up in terms of scares anymore, um, but I still enjoy it. And I still think that it's one of the best haunted house movies in horror. And considering how much I love haunted house movies, that makes it one of the top tier horror movies, in my opinion. Interesting. <laughs> It's it's hard not to um, compare, right? So you say oh, yeah. you're thinking of the '60s and the haunting, you know, haunting of the six of '63. You know, you're you're not you're not gonna watch that movie and be scared. You know what I mean by any stretch of the imagination. Um, right. yeah. But that's '73, and it's opening up the the gore of violence a little bit, and then. Literally seventy four, you have like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where it's just like, it's like okay, no holds barred now, you know, and and yeah. changes the game. And it seems like we really don't get a whole lot, like this, as far as like you know the the once we do get into Texas Chainsaw Massacre, then we kind of enter into a new era, and the notion of haunted house movies kind of takes a back seat until we get into movies like The Changeling. Um, there's another one I want to think of, but the name's escaping me. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they do kind of go by the wayside for a little while. You know, I feel like, you know, you have 63 where you have, you know, you don't see a lot. Then you go into the 70s and 80s where you see everything. You, you think of, like, House, right? Not You know, not the not the Japanese one, but the, the American one where it's like you yeah. see everything. It's, you know, fun, comedic, you know. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a carnival ride and then you go yeah, back into cheers. what are you going to do yeah and then you go back into your you know paranormal activity hits and now they're going back to the old school way where you see nothing um and you just you feel everything and you have to sense everything and you have to fill those gaps i mean really they're literally using the same style from decades ago just in an updated yeah. way you know um and I love, I, you know, I love Paranormal Activity. I, I, I love those movies. I love the movies where I don't see much. Um... And I mean, and now you're getting into, you know, now we're getting into territory of like, you know, the Flanagan series that he's been doing, you know, Bly Manor, uh, Hill House. Uh, and, you know, that's doing something that's kind of unique because it does have the time of 13, 16 episodes to really flesh that out. But it's still adhering to the old rules. It's not showing a whole lot. It having... You know, it, it's just happening over 16 hours instead of, you know, an hour and a half of, of the slow ramp up. But then it's also doing something I think that's really unique and interesting and fun, uh, but also absolutely just devastatingly heartbreaking is showing the 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 actions and then through uh, uh quantum time uh, or you know quantum uh, storytelling showing later on the events that led up to those actions and just how impactful those are with the storyline context at that point um and those are the moments that just really get you um but i i love the 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 non-linear storytelling that he's been doing and that we've been seeing um you know by having this the the the, the time fleshed out and I, I, I love, yeah, I just love haunted house movies and uh, everything about them. All right. Well, thank you everyone for watching. Really appreciate it. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't, I highly recommend uh, Hell House by Richard Matheson. It's a quick, fun read, about 300 pages, and definitely followed up with Legend of Hell House from 1973. Well worth it. It might not be scary, might not, you know, you're still going to sleep at night. You'll be fine. But it's definitely worth a watch. It's fun. And Roddy McDowell is excellent. <laughs> yes, so, yes. And I just want to say thank you to Mike from Rotted Reviews. Again, if you aren't subscribed to him, please check him out. I will leave a link in the description below. Uh, Mike, anything you want to say? Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be a part of this. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Bye.